what I'd like to do is to get people's questions uh, and rather than have each question be responded to serially, I'd like to get the questions up front so that people on the stage know what's in your minds. And we can, we can start having a conversation building on those questions. So find yourself a mic, raise your hand. OK. So uh, my question is about uh, this women's perspective. Like, all women in Afghanistan have the same perspective especially when it comes to war and peace. As of January 1st, four out of five biggest US military contractors, the CEOs are women. Do you think that's something women should be proud of or should be ashamed of? Okay, well, uh, that, that sounds like it's for Jamie and this question over here. Lynn Hughes, I'm a filmmaker. I'm working on voting rights at the moment. Um, that was a great case study. And it, as you said, there's not a lot of funding in the space, especially around impact. For all you guys, I would love to know, are there case studies or resources that you can share so that we're not rebuilding, you know, we're, we're starting fresh because we know that all of you can't fund all of us. Okay, That's, that is certainly a question for everybody. Uh, yes. So many questions, but one mic. And uh, your name. And Brenda, this is a question for Kara. Name. Putting you on the spot. Uh, the connection between yesterday, the focus on industry in Hollywood, and today. Brenda, just say who you are. Uh, I'm Brenda from Sundance. Hi there. Uh, Sahad Baba with Just Vision. Um, and this is a question for Kimberly. Um, I was, you know, I, I, I think the film Dark Mini is brilliant, and I'm curious, because of the issues that you're um, exploring in that film, um, some of the most hot button issues and most contested issues of the day today, I'm curious about whether or not you experienced any pushback and how you kind of built out your outreach campaign um, to mitigate risk of, you know, when we're looking at the environmental movement, the slap suits that are coming on deck, the RICO cases, the so on and so forth. So I'm just curious if you experienced any lawfare issues and how you kind of thought through that. Okay, go. Hi, my name is Bea Spadaccini. I have a question for Kimberly and one for Jamie. For Jamie, having worked in a nonprofit for many years as a comms person, I wonder, and doing advocacy work, how expensive is it for nonprofits to, to pair up with you guys and do a film targeted on FGM or whatever, and then use it as an advocacy tool, because that's usually the communications budget of most nonprofits is very tiny. And uh, so that's one. And for Kimberly, I'm wondering what type of um, pushback, if any, you got from Citizens United itself and some of the supporters of what I always think Citizens United is such, you know, a name <laughs> chosen on purpose to misconceive people and, you know, but the type of pushback you got, I'm curious. Thank you so much. Can I just ask if, she, if you can clarify your, your question for, for me? Do you mean um, for nonprofits to produce films to the, on an already produced film that we might be working on? Yeah, okay, and thanks. working films. Two more questions, and then we'll... Oh, Michonne, introduce um, I'm yourself. A, I'm Michonne. I have a question of, for example, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. By the time you've gotten the funding for your film, lots of people are sick or dying. And this may be a question for Kimberly. I love that you are looking at giving journalists, uh, investigative journalists, some resources to get the message out there and participate, so that's my question about when time is not on your side, you know, what are the strategies for that? And one, one last question before, we'll take another round of questions, but go. Oh, I, uh, yeah, uh, hi, Andrew Slack, formerly of the Harry Potter Alliance, now of uh, campaign director at Avaz, which is a international version of Move On. Um, uh, I am overwhelmed by the power of all of you. They're just powerful stories, and how do we, um, like, if I didn't know anything about this, and I feel a luxury to know, to know some of it, um, where do I go? Is there, the, is there a Wikipedia, like a wiki version, 
of people being able to log what they've done and see the web, because each of these things is so powerful and overwhelming and, and awe-inspiring, but all of it together is like this meta-transformative thing. So how can, we, how can we see it more clearly? So uh, great uh, set of questions, some of them very specific and some of them general. I want to I want to um, I want to start with probably the most general question, which is was the uh, uh, second question asked by Lynn and the last question by Andrew, uh, which is once we leave here, how do we keep track of all of this? information and all of these resources. One of the things I was impressed by yesterday was the wealth of information that I found on the websites of the speakers. Um, and before I turn this over to our panelists, I just want to point out that the Center for Media and Social Impact, in fact, has a, a, a deep, deep library uh, of these materials. Uh, Katie Chatu has also written some overview pieces on uh, strategy and research that are really um, uh, extremely helpful. Uh, and this, if I'm not wrong, there will be a rapporteur's report coming out of this uh, out of this conference that will have links to the kinds of resources that were presented here today. However, I know each of you also can point to resources and has resources. So starting with Molly. Yeah. Hi. Um, I would want to recognize the Doc Society's Impact Field Guide in addition to kind of showcasing methodology around making an impact with documentaries. It lifts up uh, institutions, organizations that are doing the work. Uh, the Fledgling Fund also has a provider directory that is a great resource to see, uh, you know, both independents and organizations working in this space. And then I too would recognize uh, Center for Media and Social Impacts reports, um, which, you know, are a great resource. Um, Andrew, I take your point. I think that it's a project that we have to do. I think it's an emergent field combined with some legacy fields that are now intersecting in ways that we haven't seen before and we want to promote. So I actually think it's a project that can be undertaken and started or continued. There are some like media impact funders has resources, but nobody has the map that connects, for instance, Brenda's question, the map that connects across content, across commercial to non-commercial and then the underlying architecture of how we think about narrative change and narrative shift and the resources that are coming into that space now. So I take it as a, yeah, I'd love to keep talking about that with folks. Um, yeah, I would just echo what other people have said. Doc Society's resources are fantastic and we use them a lot. Yeah, I agree. So Doc Society has a, a new field guide that's, that's coming out. BD, when is it, when is it launching? What was that? Oh, soon, soon. It's okay, Beatty. It's okay. It's okay. Um, but it's really, it's really great. Um, and, uh, and and so I would say, yeah, Doc Society. I mean, it's um, this field. It, you know, Molly and I together with with other impact producers and with with Firelight and and nonprofits that are that are doing this work have been sort of um, part of a bit of a field building effort over the past couple of of years to see. Um, what might uh, emerge, um, and and certainly um, resourcing has been the number one concern that has been um, brought up by by folks in those in those groups, especially independents um, who work outside of nonprofits like Working Films and Firelight and and Pieces Loud, who aren't able to do this work because the resources aren't aren't there. And I think we do all approach the work in really different ways and from very from different fields and so something we've talked about a lot is like um, like as impact producers like what is the common language for our work around which we coalesce and how do we make ourselves um, known as a field rather than as kind of disparate siloed organizations and individuals that do impact work around film and I think that's something we're all trying to to figure out right now. Molly, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, thank you. I think you said it. Great. Uh, well, I, I have to say that one of the things that I think is uh, exciting to see, and I, I really love the word that Kara was using, emergent, is the interaction between academic research and researchers and 
the makers, producers, and the impact producers. And we saw some of that programmed yesterday as well. And we saw how valuable it is to get beyond, uh, uh, wow, that made, that just, I know that made such a difference to, I know what I'm trying to do, and I understand the best research grounding the logic here. And that's not just research in, in psychology, uh, it's, it's also research in, in political science and, and in sociology. Um, so we also have um, we also have individual questions, and shall we, shall, shall we efficiently address them? Kimberly, you want to go first? I know you had a. Uh, sure. Yeah. Actually, both of the questions for me sort of uh, uh, circled around the idea of pushback and what sort of uh, what what results did we see? Did we get pressure from some of the people? Um, I, so there's a book called Dark Money that was written by Jitch is Brilliant and everybody should read it and I had an opportunity to um, go out to dinner. She came to one of our screenings and uh, it was really interesting to compare notes because as she was um, poking around and, and basically uh, agitating the Koch brothers network, um, she got a lot of pushback from them because they did not like the direction that she was going in. Uh, at the scale that I was working in, I did not have the same issue. Um, by keeping it on the, the local scale, um, the folks who were involved in it certainly knew what was going on. I was actually trying to get, the, I mentioned that a film ends up in a courtroom trial, I was trying to get that guy, there's one uh, politician who's held accountable for campaign finance violations, which sort of becomes the, 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 the crux of this microcosmic storytelling, uh, storytelling that we're doing. Um, I was very much engaging with him and trying to get him on camera, and we talked to as many of, of the folks who were on the other side of the argument as we could, so they knew that we were there and, um, and trying to cover that story. But... Um, one of the advantages to making a film is, you know, we're gathering this footage and then we go sit in a dark room for a year and you sort of pop out with this thing that's done and it hits really quickly and you don't have to go through the, um, the process that Jane Mayer was going through, writing something through, the, starting with the New Yorker where you're constantly fact checking and running and everything is going past them. So they didn't have a, a chance to, to shut us down basically, I think is what happened. Um, and I'm grateful for that. But uh, the other thing that we did to sort of inoculate against all of that was to keep the film as bipartisan as, as possible. And I don't really even mean bipartisan, I mean nonpartisan. We were telling a story that was taking place in, um, I'm, now I'm gonna start talking in partisan terms so that I can just kind of thwart that. But we're telling a story that's taking uh, place in a red state. Um, all of the protagonists in our film were Republican legislators who were attacked by dark money coming from their own party. So by telling that internecine uh, story, we could kind of inoculate ourselves from getting into a discussion that would just be seen as, as this right, left, red, blue partisan issue. Um, we did have uh, a pretty prominent editorial uh, that was written. It actually um, was concerned with, with financing and, and knowing where our money was coming from, uh, which has always been stated very clearly on our website. And at the end credits of the film, it was like, this is where our money is coming from. So I didn't feel like that, uh, that held much sway. Um, but yes, so I would just say a combination of like, you know, releasing really quickly and um, trying to inoculate ourselves by just talking about the issue which has 75, 80% of the American public routinely says that we need campaign finance reform. There's a small portion of people who don't. So that's, that was our audience that we were focusing on and I think that inoculated us. Yeah, so I think there were a couple of questions. First, the gentleman's question about um, women in Afghanistan. I certainly don't think that Afghan women are, are monolithic. My, my point was about media representation, and it was about under-representation and over-representation, and what are the stories of 
women in Afghanistan, for example, that are that are underrepresented, and and the story of women um, vying for a place at the peace table, the story of um, how um, peace is more likely to endure when women are represented at the table. These are stories that we don't very often hear in media coverage of conflict and in foreign policy. So that was that was my point there. Um, to your question, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, in fact, we we would pay you to be in involved in, 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 the, in the film, so um, in the film campaign. So the way that we, um, the way that we do it, and, and this is part of what I was gonna talk about with, um, with, uh, with partnership building is, I mean, as a nonprofit, we're also a nonprofit, we fundraise for, for all of our work. We co-fundraise with the filmmakers for th the most part. Some of our work is fee-for-service, but we do do a lot of co-fundraising for the campaigns. And when nonprofits do partner with us in, when we're partnering with nonprofits in, in, in deep ways, sometimes we'll build money into the budgets to be able to compensate the nonprofits for, for, their, for their work and time. And certainly, nonprofits that participate in brain trust and strategy planning, we are providing stipends and honorariums for that for that work. So one example that I was gonna bring up in this kind of partnership building, I think it was lesson maybe number four um, or three, um, is is a, a film that we worked on um, called The Uncondemned about survivors of sexual violence in, in conflict in, in Rwanda who are actively fighting for, for justice. And we had a partner in the Congo who is a longtime partner of, of Pieces Louds on a number uh, a number of films who really wanted to um, use this film to help prepare women survivors um, throughout Kivu, the Kivu province, who were preparing to testify in local mobile courts. And so they wanted to use this film as part of that preparation for these women giving their, their testimony. Because we know this partner very well, I mean, we had a lot of in-depth conversations, and um, in addition to the conversation being about the security for the women in, in doing this, it was really like what are the outcomes and how are we going to operationalize this and realizing that to be really effective we were going to have to dub this film into Swahili. It was not subtitling. We needed to dub the film, okay? And this is, this takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of time. Pieces Loud went out and we fundraised to be able to do that with the partner and then made a grant. We, we're not a granting organization but we made a, a grant to this partner to be able to then execute execute the work and, and help with the, the dubbing. Yeah. Does that, is that helpful? Yeah. Molly, you also have a comment? Yeah, I also wanted to respond to the same question about ways that organizations can partner with working films and then also to the question about funding. And uh, similar to Pieces Loud, we, um, we uh, work with organizations in a collaborative way. We seek funding for their participation. We always say like we work between these two uh, under-resourced entities, documentary, independent documentary filmmakers and nonprofit organizations and grassroots groups. So we seek support um, to, uh, for the time of organizations to inform the work that we're doing. Um, so right now, for example, I didn't talk about it, um, but we have a fund that funds short films on the topics we're working to address, and partner organizations participate in developing the call for media and participate in the panel of selecting those films. Um, and we compensate for their participation in that. And then we do the nuts and bolts work of you know, lifting the capacity of organizations who might not have the capacity to put on 150 film screenings in target communities across the US. And we do everything from booking the venues to developing the press releases and distributing them um, to the social media, to any and everything that's needed, which depending on the capacity of the organization can really vary. Um, so we're very much mostly an in-kind support to partner organizations, but also do seek compensation if they're coming and speaking for their time or, you know, are really fair in that. We also compensate the filmmakers who are featured in our compilations of films, and we're trying to raise the bar of what short films are compensated. Uh, for their creation and use, so we work out package deals if we know we're going to tour a collection of short films across maybe 80 or ho however many communities 
over a certain amount of time work out uh, you know, a rate agreement of compensation for the screening rights. And we just really, um, you know, really is a lesson to others to want to value the art and recognize the art. And that's a lot of the skill building that we do with organizations that we work with too, is to help to inform them about the cost that goes into making a documentary and why we pay screening rights. And if we are covering it, why we're doing that and making the case that they should always be doing that too. So that's a bit about how we partner with organizations. And we work topically, so I, I focused on the environment. The next topic area is immigration. Uh, we anticipate working on housing and disability as future issues. We've kind of built out um, this thematic approach of using multiple films to address the issue. Um, and it's relatively new since like 2013, a real flip siding of how we do our work. Uh, for the funding question and how we fund impact, uh, overwhelmingly our funding comes from issue focused funders um, because there is a smaller pool, um, although they're incredible, that are funding impact campaigns as the focus of what they're doing. Uh, so we prospect, you know, when we begin an initiative, prospect donors working in the area and cultivate that as we're in development. Um, and then aggressively, you know, raise money uh, from issue funders. I was just going to say it's the same for Pieces Loud. Um, a lot of our funding comes from from issue issue funders. Um, but I did want to say for I know there are a lot of um, folks in the audience who work with scripted content, and I would encourage um, I would encourage you to look at um, the Roma and National Domestic Workers Alliance partnership if you're if if you are interested in bringing nonprofits into your work. I just think it's a really interesting kind of case study and example of how a how scripted content can really like fit seamlessly into a nonprofit organization's work and I just love what they've what they've done together. Kara Grant um, I'll build on both of those because you're uh, headed in the direction of Brenda's question, which is what's the relationship of yesterday to today? Right, the industry focus, the commercial Hollywood focus, and then today is a sort of more classic nonprofit, um, documentary, nonfiction focus. And I guess I, I, I'll try and tackle it just from what I've seen being at Ford Foundation and, and through a bit of genealogy. The first thing I'll say is that this didn't come out of the blue. Um, and in terms of a foundation like Ford Foundation, well, let me start again. What I presented today around Just Films um, that focuses on organizations that are helping nonfiction filmmakers is the kind of legacy piece, traditional, uh, especially Ford, MacArthur foundations that are trying to work in the space of media and storytelling will choose a nonprofit approach. Documentary is not typically a for-profit activity, at least not until $10 million at Sundance this year given to knock down the house, but, but you know, historically it's been a not-for-profit space for a social justice foundation, right? Um, and so you see the kind of strategy built out globally um, that we, that I've been able to kind of pursue at Just Films. But that's one side of Just Films as I've been kind of designing it. There's a second outer ring that's an incubation ring that's actually trying to follow the question of narrative power and how you harness narrative power at a moment where you see the disintegration of our democratic institutions, which is the challenge of 2016. Um, but before that as well, uh, it's just become very blatant with this particular administration, um, as opposed to being kind of covered by corporate, you know, covered, covered by a lot of um, other uh, ways of governing, et cetera. It, now we just see it's kind of unveiled for what it is, right? Um, and so in the last 10 years, I would say, in the issue areas, as you all are talking about, in the issue areas in a social justice foundation like Ford Foundation, there have been funding leaders who have been capacitizing people like Ai-jen Poo, who you know, started the NWDA, um, NDWA. Color of Change has received millions of dollars of funding from Ford and other foundations like Open Societies Foundation for the last 12 to 15 years to build out their approach, right? And increasingly, people are converging. Organizations and leaders are converging around this notion of narrative writ large. And we're seeing the nonfiction space come into that and with many lessons learned, but the for-profit industries are also um, seeing leaders, especially leaders of color, but also leaders of, of sort of conscientious intention actually realizing that they can make decisions that are different from the decisions that they were making before, that are not just marketplace de de decisions, that is beginning to make market sense 
to actually take into account the rising new majority in those populations, so African American populations, Latinx audiences. So there's a way that people are building out their knowledge and their um, choice making as they are influencers in terms of who they're hiring to write scripts, who they are hiring to direct, uh, who they are thinking about both behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, and that's the space that Katie has been working in, that a number of folks have been really trying to understand better. And for you know, the incubation space of Just Films, we've been trying to understand and help educate the rest of the foundation how we can strategically intervene with private foundation money in a way that's responsible and does not fall into, um, you know, I would say the trap of funding a bunch of commercial movies and saying, you know, we're gonna get the next green book out in the world and calling that a victory, which is exactly what Participant has done. I think a lot of us have a question about that particular narrative, but that's a trap that you might fall into as a foundation saying, we wanna make a massive change at scale, and so we're gonna fund commercial product that is gonna reach people at scale, partially because it has a marketing campaign. We don't wanna do that. We wanna change the people that are making the decisions about what's funded, and it's a long-term play. It's, it's looking at rising leaders in the industry um, who have this framework that I was talking about, the framework that allows you to analyze and make choices that you think will result in systemic change, not in one-off change. And those leaders, many of them are leaders of color in mid-management. And in five years, they're gonna be running the studios. And so working with them now and educating them about what a social justice issue looks like, what a movement looks like, and what change, dynamic change, social change looks like, I think will result in an increasing number of choices that we'll want to see and, and celebrate in this space. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I, I was going to add to that um, and, and, and just say, you know, Peace is Loud, we've, we've started dabbling in the scripted content space, also advising on um, social impact for a, a Broadway show that is issue aligned with our organization um, and really thinking about the whole storytelling ecosystem and how our social change strategies translate or don't translate. Um, and I don't have an answer yet. I think for me, um, it was really interesting. I don't know if Hashida is still here who spoke um, yesterday from Caring Across Generations, but I appreciated her very honest sort of reflections and, and, and comments and saying that, you know, for, for her, that certainly, like, there are some production companies who, you know, they care about who's in the writing room because they think they're gonna get in trouble if they don't think about it. And so it's kind of like really parsing, out, like, the motivations because I do think that um, that's, like, the motivations of, of, of the, the productions, I feel like when hard decisions need to be made, like that's what's gonna kind of come to the, the fore. But I, I don't wanna put, um, so Ellen Friedman, who's the, who's the director of Compton Foundation, has been a long time um, you know, partner of Pieces Louds. I'm just curious, Ellen, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I am. You've been funding at the intersection of media and social impact for a really long time from sort of a different um, a different perspective, and I just think it would be helpful for people to hear sort of just your your reflections on on the, this question. Would you be willing to share? Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Um, well, thank you all. This has actually been really interesting, and I don't know if this is directly an answer to what you're saying, but the conversation that you're having is actually making me think that we're at this really important inflection point in the whole social justice organizing framework. And that what Kara is talking about and Molly and certainly Peace is Loud and the dark money example seems to me to be raising a question about how we um, in the social justice world do organizing. And that has been one of the things that at the Compton Foundation we're thinking about very deeply is like who really gets the use of partner of that partnership in a way that leads to transformation and not just transaction. And one of you said that um, at some point that I thought was so important. And so I think trying to understand both on the filmmaker side and impact producer side how to partner, the other is actually the harder partnership which is building the understanding in organizers to be able to really um, take hold of the power that exists in a new model 
um, that I think is really, really important. And supporting the ecosystem is something we've been thinking about, and certainly with Peace is Loud and Just Vision, we've been thinking a lot about how you fund all pieces of the ecosystem because you need that ecosystem to be robust. I love that, I love that you say that, Ellen. Sorry, I'm going to no, no. ju jump in because I, identifying that quest, question of the nature of organizing and broadening the spectrum of what can fall under that, I think, is exactly, I mean, you've, you've completely nailed it. I want to just add two examples because I'm known for being the red balloon floating off, very conceptual. There are two concrete examples in the room. One is, I don't know if Bridget is still here, but Pop Culture Collaborative is a result of this thinking. It's 10 foundations coming together to weave back and forth in the space between philanthropy, social justice leadership, and entertain changers. And the second is Firelight Media and what they're doing uh, to bring social justice leaders together with storytellers very intentionally in safe space to cross-educate each other and then enter back into, Ellen, I love the phrase, enter back into the social justice movement building with a larger canvas and a bigger tool set. Okay, and uh, uh, Jamie, you were about to say something. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, um, we have a few more minutes. All right, so let's, let's take around three more questions. Hello, um, I am a filmmaker and um, it's been a really wonderful panel so far. I have a very specific question, which is, um, I embarked upon my first feature film last year. Um, there's been a growing amount of grassroots resistance in the region that I grew up in in Virginia around a pipeline that's coming through. Um, and I was arrested while filming a protest, which is a common thing to have happen in these spaces. I, my background as a photojournalist let me know of some resources that I could tap into, but I don't know of film-based ones, so are there like legal resources while you're in the middle of making a film if this happens, um, or just more generally like I guess strategies of, of like what you've seen or experienced, I'm sure you guys have dealt with some of this with, with filmmakers. I would just love to hear some insights. Thank you. Your question specifically is around legal questions? Uh, on the legal stuff. Okay, great. Um, and you? Uh, hi, my name is Tyler Smith. I'm an uh, instructor. I teach students how to make film. Uh, I'm really curious about, and this is for everyone, uh, how do we move past the classical Hollywood form, this structure? I read an article this morning, Steven Spielberg saying, responding to Roma, saying it's not a film, it's not a motion picture, right? And so when we continue to have the dominant ideology or the dominant structure in place, providing language that's saying this is or is not film, I just find it's really interesting uh, in the documentary realm specifically who, that already has a struggle to be seen in theaters uh, being defined as not a motion picture, not a film. How do we move past that? Okay, and anybody else? Question here. How does critical reception, uh, not just a Peabody Award or a Sundance or a Tribeca or even a great New York Times review, how does that translate or could it be used for impact? Not your vanity, not your award, not more grants, but for impact. How can accolades feed into a campaign? Okay, one last question. Way in back. Hi, I'm Kirsten Kelly, a filmmaker. And there's incredibly inspiring work happening around these these networks, and um, it, it feels like such relief as a filmmaker. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of social justice storytelling and moving the needle, if there is thoughts or strategies and conversations happening with all of you about filmmakers working on similar issue films, like multiple building on let's say domestic violence or mass incarceration. There's so much we can learn from each other and how to build on each other's impact campaigns to move the needle that, that I feel like that's a lot of conversations filmmakers are starting to have. And I wonder where that's happening in your space. Well, you, you've really been making people think. Okay, who wants, who wants to jump in? 
Uh, I would jump in, uh, maybe going in reverse. Um, I think that this question, I mean, Dark Money took six years to make, and I've just been on the road for the last year, taking it around of, during our theatrical and, and broadcast. And um, when you look at spending that much time on one specific project, I think it's really understandable why filmmakers get really touchy about, oh my God, I heard that somebody over there is doing something that's kind of similar and I don't want to tell them about my film and I'm going to keep it secret and we have to make sure that they don't find out anything. Um, and, and I want to get the, I want to get the intel on their film. Um, it's, it, it's a big question and it, and there, it gets inflamed every once in a while when somebody shows up a little bit later or maybe they started 10 years ago and they've been thinking about it and how do we decide who's going to get to tell this story. Um, I generally feel like, the, you know, rising tide raises all boats and I am almost always trying to kind of bridge between these different films and foster that dialogue. Um, some of our uh, executive producers, uh, David and Linda Cornfield, um, have uh, supported the films by Jeff Orlovsky, Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice. And they've been thinking a lot about this question, which relates to somebody else's question about, um, about having common resources. Is it possible to build, um, in many ways, what Doc Society has really already done this, like um, this, a repository of intel that you need to have a effective outreach strategy for a film. Um, what they're looking at doing is building on top of that um, through Jeff and his work so that there can be, I don't know, for example, a common set of WordPress uh, templates that you use as a filmmaker so you don't have to pay a web designer to create a website for your film. You can just use this common thread or some way to host and pay for that so that you know three years after your film comes out, it d just doesn't fall off the face of the earth. So I think those are really uh, smart and effective ways to foster dialogue within the film community. And um, that, but that also has to be balanced um, against what you hear, all of these examples up here, which is this really strong customization for strategies that need to happen for specific films. I mean, um, I didn't experience, you know, the appeal to evangelicals in that, those 21 districts, but, I, but that was a very effective strategy, so. Um, you really have to customize and you can't build that one, you know, fits all solution for everybody. But yeah, the more, the more the merrier. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the, just the legal questions, I would say um, I've only done, made films in New York and California, really in, around those filmmaking communities. If you have a connection, there's California lawyers for the arts and New York lawyers for the arts, which may be able to, to if, if somebody on your film is connected with that, that might be a good legal resource for you. Yeah. If I can just leap in on the legal stuff, uh, there's a report that CMSI did call, uh, called Dangerous Documentaries. So you can go to cmsi.org slash dangerous documentaries. And the appendix has a number of legal resources. Also, there's a, there's a grant program through IDA uh, that in collaboration with a reporter's committee on freedom of the press for doing pre-production uh, uh, legal help, which can often yeah. uh, mitigate problems later. I know Molly had a comment. Yeah, then. I also want to respond to the last question first. We started working uh, with multiple films around the same issues about 10 years ago, really recognizing that complex problems require complex solution and there's usually not one film that's gonna tell the full story um, and to provide entry points for different stakeholders. And we did that um, mostly focused with the filmmakers at first on, uh, I think the first one was around women and girls, then on uh, clean energy and the uh, clean energy and climate change. We did it on the economy, education, aging. And in doing that work, it really led to a flip side in our organization. We had for about the first 
13 years, I led individual film campaigns, starting with one film and leading the campaign for that one film over the course of a couple years. And what we did in 2013 was a complete flip side um, to focus instead on big issues and then meet the needs of movements uh, with the media that they needed and not just one film. And what we found is that it's a benefit to filmmakers who might have films on the same topic area because our partner organizations become more receptive to using film, more acquainted and training them and the best ways to leverage film in their work is part of what we do. And once they've had a great experience showing a film, they just want more. And so we're able to support both the organizations and filmmakers, and in that process, we support peer-to-peer -peer support among the filmmakers, bringing them into communities and or into community with one another. Um, and in residencies, residencies that we've done, it's led on for those filmmakers to be doing collaborative work in the future. Um, so we've really, you know, just seen the you know, the benefit of that and are, are grateful that as an organization that's something that we can do. I wanted to say something about the, I, I don't think we've responded to a question in the first round about timing. Uh, and we have uh, realized that issues come up that we need to respond to rapidly. So we've sought support for rapid response. It's basically a pot of um, funding that we hold when a crisis occurs, when the coal ash spill happens, when, um, you know, if there's a racist attack or something that we need to move on quickly. We have, um, you know, basically spent time securing funds that we can rapidly respond in that way. And then I don't have any legal advice, but we do a lot of work around pipeline resistance and would just love to talk to you about that because we also have partners across Virginia. So Jamie and Kara, you each get one minute to bring us home here. That's it. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, yeah, you, you should have the last word, Kara. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I guess just one very practical thing about the legal um, advice and my other life as a filmmaker. Um, I had pro bono representation from Cardozo, I don't know who asked the question, Cardozo Law School in New York. They have an entertainment clinic and they actually take on films pro bono. It's a secret that I think not a lot of now a lot of people will know. Um, but that was amazing for, for me. Um, I'm rather than like final thoughts, I'm going to answer the um, the question about the award, uh, was it awards? It was like, how, do, how can awards or critical reception? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, it's an audience question, actually. It's, it's um, what is, who is the audience that you're trying to reach? For example, the Armor of Light film. Um, I would say the most, helpful, uh, the most helpful piece of critical reception was this, um, like, I think it was called the, the Dove Seal. Is that right, Stephanie? It was, yeah, it was called the Dove Seal, and it was something that I honestly had not heard of but was very influential in the white conservative evangelical community and that meant like everything um so we were like we got to get that seal like that's that's the, you know that's what we we need and um and just also a story i was thinking of when you asked that question was you know the film was on netflix um and there was this really interesting moment where netflix i can't remember exactly how it happened but netflix delivered the and i don't know if i should be sharing this but i'm going to the artwork for the thumbnail for the for the film right and with netflix it's like really important that the thumbnail looks a certain way so people will click on it right so it needs to be like somewhat provocative and like it has to look good like this size and so they deliver this image and it is a gun that's wrapped in an american flag and the handle of the gun is a crucifix and it's a very provocative image, right? But we had at this point, we had developed very strong partnerships in the evangelical community. We had a, a group of advisors and we sent them the image. And they said, if you use this image, you're done. Like, not only will, e will evangelicals not watch this film, but they will be very offended by, you know, by this imagery. So it was a really difficult conversation with Netflix of like, we're not going to use this image we want to use this other image that was not as provocative, nearly, and they told us, you're not going to get as many views, and we said, that's okay. And so, I mean, that's, a, that's an example of like, how to like, navigate impact with more kind of, I guess, commercial appeal. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and Karen. Um, I'll go back, I'm not gonna land us home, but um, I'm gonna go back to this question of time and the idea of change is slow until it isn't. 
Um, I thought it was a really wonderful question. You know, it was actually the Flint advocates um, that I was uh, reading about. As I was writing this talk, I had seen another Flint film, and one of the people in, in Flint said, you know, we were screaming as loud as we could for two years, and nobody heard us. So they were there, they had evidence, the medical conditions were there, um, the realities were there, and people just weren't listening, um, refusing to listen, and therefore not heard. Um, and then the article that came out, the series of articles that came out that really put it in the national spotlight, and then it's disappeared. Flint citizens still don't have clean water, right? It's five years, five years later? Um, so change is slow until it isn't. So keep in mind that your stories, you may feel they're urgent because it's happening right now. Um, but so many of the problems that we're dealing with are endemic systems problems that don't go away. Um, they just reoccur in another form. And so the pieces that you're making, I would say two things. Make sure that you're ready to use some of the work that you're doing, some of the content that you're doing in short form very quickly when the moment strikes. Just have that ready whether it's short pieces or headlines or framing questions or uh, descriptions or a trailer or something like that. Um, and then keep in mind that, that because you're engaged in a long-term relationship with a community or an issue, there's great value in longitudinal storytelling that is much more powerful than the quick, you know, the quick fix. Um, so you have both of those things, um, or I would say folks that are working on content have both of those attributes to work with. And then I will close with one final thing, and that is that I don't think it's a coincidence that so much of this work is being led by women right now. Thank you all. Quick break.